Um, I've had the, the pleasure of introducing quite a few of these knowledge exchange seminars over the last two, three years. I've never seen a crowd like this, and I think it does reflect the thirst and the appetite uh, for information uh, in what is clearly an, clearly an era uh, of uncertainty. Uh, on a party political basis, I took uh, the Ulster Unionist MLAs uh, to Brussels uh, in September on a fact-finding mission, uh, which turned out to be a little ambitious because there are no facts. So hopefully today you will at least get opinions which can, can nudge you forward. Uh, I'm not here in a party political sense. I'm here as chair of the committee uh, of the executive office, and on that basis, uh, you're all very welcome to Parliament buildings. Uh, as you know, just over three months ago, uh, the people of the United Kingdom uh, voted to leave the European Union. Uh, and while in Northern Ireland and Scotland the majority were for a Remain, we know the UK government uh, intends to invoke Article 50 uh, no later than the end of March in 2017. So the clock will then be ticking uh, and the UK is likely to have to withdraw from the EU uh, by April 2019. Now, of course, there could be an extension, uh, but only if unanimously agreed between the UK and the 27 uh, remaining member states. And you need only look at what the Prime Minister has been saying recently about the UK retaining control over immigration against what the Visegrad Four have been saying uh, out in uh, the east of Europe to understand the depth of tension uh, that is likely to arise. Uh, we all know that for political, economic, geographic and social reasons, the impact on Northern Ireland of UK withdrawal uh, might be expected to differ in some very important ways uh, to the impact on the withdrawal in other parts of the UK. Uh, we also know that the UK's priorities in the Article 50 negotiations may not necessarily be the same as our own. The Prime Minister has reiterated, uh, most recently in her Conservative Party conference speech, that the government is going to consult and work with the devolved administrations in Scotland, Wales and here in Northern Ireland. But she's also making clear the negotiations will be conducted by the UK government and the UK government alone. Uh, by not invoking Article 50 immediately, uh, the UK government has given itself some time to develop a negotiating strategy. Now, here in Northern Ireland, I believe we need to use that time, uh, albeit limited, uh, to focus on what we should be asking the UK government to achieve during the withdrawal negotiations. Uh, and in my view, and it is a personal view, we need urgently to assess our policy options, then define our priorities, and then figure out whether they complement or whether they clash with the UK government's priorities. Now, different options will play out differently in different parts of the United Kingdom, and we need to fully explore the challenges and the opportunities which EU withdrawal will present for Northern Ireland. And once Article 50 is triggered and negotiations between the UK and the 27 of the EU commence, uh, we need to ensure that Northern Ireland robustly makes the case for Northern Ireland. We have to ensure our voice is heard and that we are listened to. And we must ensure our interests are promoted by the UK government and that our interests are protected. In that uh, regard, the Assembly has an important role to play, uh, not restricted to scrutinising the executive's engagement with the UK government uh, during the leave negotiations. We also must be proactive throughout this process identifying challenges and opportunities that will be faced by Northern Ireland post-Brexit. In the previous mandate, as part of its inquiry into opportunity for excellence, the Enterprise, Trade and Investment Committee commissioned a report on the consequences for the Northern Ireland economy uh, of a United Kingdom exit from the European Union. And this report stimulated significant debate, and the analysis contained within it has been widely cited including in the Executive Office paper on the impact of UK withdrawal. In the current mandate, with the result of the referendum known, both the Committee for the Executive Office and the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs have been exploring in greater depth the potential impacts for Northern Ireland of the Leave decision. Uh, and in plenary last month, the Assembly held a debate on a vision for Northern Ireland outside the European Union. And again, if I can take my committee chair hat off for a moment, I say that debate was on a, a party political paper that I helped to draw up. And the point of the debate, which was encapsulated in the motion, uh, was, was that we should adopt the approach 
to find in the paper, not necessarily the fine detail in the paper. And that approach was threefold. To find a vision of how Northern Ireland could prosper in a post-Brexit environment. Ensure that we have a plan with the intellectual capacity and the resource to monitor developments in a live sense because you have to react as the environment changes. And it will change, sometimes rapidly. Uh, last week, the Executive Committee heard from the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Finance, who told us that the Chancellor's latest statement on EU-funded projects, uh, when he loosened up uh, eligibility, had probably reduced the value of local projects at risk from around a billion euro to less than 100 million, a 90% swing in one sentence, in one speech. And the third element is what I call the 10 key asks, by which I mean measures by which the public can decide how successful we have been in promoting the interests of Northern Ireland. And that, of course, is only part uh, of the political reaction to the referendum. Individual MLAs have been active since the 23rd of June. They've asked close to 200 assembly questions with a Brexit element. And of course, Today's seminar represents one more way in which the Assembly is working to encourage a greater understanding of how different Brexit decisions may impact here in Northern Ireland. And developing such understanding is essential if we're to make a solid case and get the best deal for Northern Ireland out of the negotiations. So today's case addresses a number of topics of importance uh, and, uh, and we do have a very full afternoon ahead and let me apologize, our committee meets in a moment so I will not be able to stay with you I will hope to return later on. I'm not going to rehearse the topics that each speaker will address, and I'd like to say I'm pleased that the presentations are not focused on positions. Instead, they focus on examining options. And as I said earlier, different options may well play out differently across the United Kingdom as well as here in Northern Ireland. And for this reason, we need to explore and understand the challenges and the opportunities which various options will present. On that note, I'd like to welcome the first of our speakers today, that's Professor John Gary, who will discuss the EU referendum vote in Northern Ireland and the implications for our understanding of citizens' political views and behaviours. John. Oh, well, thanks very much for that very kind introduction. And before Mike uh, exits the room, I will say that... Um, even though there is a lot of uncertainty about the EU and you suggested that there won't be facts, just opinions, I will be presenting facts and interpretations. Um, the title of the talk is The EU Referendum Vote in Northern Ireland, Implications for Our Understanding of Citizens' Political Views and Behaviour. And I have a simple departure question, which is, why did people vote the way they did in the EU referendum? And I want to try to offer a couple of evidence-based interpretations of why people voted the way they did. First of all is what I call the ethno-national interpretation. And that is, essentially, you can have a vote on anything in Northern Ireland, doesn't matter what it is, and it will map onto the underlying divide in Northern Ireland between Catholic nationalists and uh, Protestant unionists. Um, in other words... Northern Ireland politics is about one thing, and it doesn't matter what issue you fling into the political arena, it'll always be about that one thing. To give one example from recent years, when we had a, a referendum on the alternative vote, which you might imagine was a relatively arcane procedural issue about the nuances of different electoral systems, by far the biggest predictor of voting in that referendum was whether you were Catholic or Protestant. Uh, you might think, why was that? Well, one interpretation is um, Catholics traditionally much more in favour of proportionality, uh, Protestants less in favour of proportionality. That's my speculative interpretation. But the point is that um, some scholars believe that when you have an EU referendum, it's not really necessarily totally about the EU. It'll be about the fundamental issue that's typically at play in the polity and in Northern Ireland. That's the ethno-national dimension. Second interpretation is the one that's quite prevalent in Britain at the moment, and this comes under the somewhat confusing, somewhat catchy title of interpreting Brexit by seeing people who voted to leave as, quote, those who are left behind by globalisation. In other words, there's a certain cluster of people in society who have certain demographic traits, 
and certain clusters of attitudes, and they feel that they are vulnerable to the forces of globalization and vulnerable to the kind of um, regional integration projects such as the EU, which is based on the free movement of labor and the free movement of capital. And people who don't have adaptable skill sets are, feel vulnerable to such a process and are therefore likely to be against it. Third interpretation is simply, well, par people row in behind their parties. If your party advocates a particular position, then you're likely to follow it. What I also want to do is address the question, what would, happen, what would have happened if everybody had voted? Typically, after any electoral event, commentators say, oh, well, the people who didn't vote, imagine if, if they had voted, um, it would have affected the result in some way. So I tried to provide an answer to that question, were the people who abstained uh, different from the people who voted, and which side would have done better if everyone had voted. The data that I used, uh, apologies, the cameraman, I forgot to move my water over. Oh, I did, I've stolen someone else's, sorry. <laughs> there you Keep your wallets in your bags, folks, I might steal something. <clears throat> the data that I use, it comes from the Northern Ireland Assembly Election Study data project that I'm the director of. Now, this is a research council funded project by the ESRC. And essentially what happened is I used the, our team used the resources to fund a very large scale representative survey that was conducted around the time of the referendum. The N is very large, the data is high quality. We have an N of 4,000, which is representative of the wider Northern Ireland population and therefore it's a big enough survey conducted at an appropriate time in order to address the kinds of questions that I've just been outlining. First of all, can we predict or explain voting on the basis of the ethno-national characteristics of Northern Ireland voters? Yes, it's the short answer. If we look, break down voting by ca whether you're Catholic or Protestant and we look at people who voted to leave only 15% of Catholics voted to leave the EU, but 60% of Protestants voted to leave the EU. These are very, very big percentage differences in the two groups. If we interpret the ethno-national divide not so much in the demographic of religion, but rather um, how one characterizes oneself ideologically on the ethno-national dimension, and we ask people, how would you describe yourself as a unionist or a nationalist or neither? We get similar-ish results. 66% of Northern Ireland people who describe themselves as unionists voted to leave. Only 12% of people who describe themselves as nationalists voted to leave. Very big differences. People who said, don't be trying to put me into one box or another. Thank you very much. I'll, I am, I'm not in any, any of those boxes. These people who say that they're neither nationalist nor unionist, they're more similar to, to nationalists. Only 30% of them voted to leave. If you slice the ethno-national cake in terms of asking people to which national identity they adhere to or feel themselves associated with, the results are, are similar. People who describe themselves as British, almost two-thirds voted to leave. People who describe themselves as Irish, only 13%. Not many people describe themselves as Ulster, um, but most of them, 70% of them, wanted to leave. The Northern Irish identity is always interesting, in my view, and quite a number of people opt to call themselves, describe themselves as Northern Irish. About a quarter of people in Northern Ireland do so. And only a third of these people who say they're Northern Irish uh, voted to leave. So people who um, identify with that particular characterization of themselves in terms of identity are more pro-European. The last way to slice the ethno-national cake is to ask people what their constitutional preferences are for the long-term future of Northern Ireland. And this is broken down into three options. Respondents who say I'd like, to, I'd like Northern Ireland to stay in the UK and I'd like direct rule. They wanted to leave, 60% of them. People who say, I want to unify with the Republic of Ireland, only 15% they wanted to leave. People who adopted a middle ground position, I want to stay in the UK but I want 
a strong devolved assembly, roughly halfway between the two. And so um, the upshot of that is these different ways of characterizing the underlying division in Northern Ireland politics, they all point in the same direction. It doesn't matter how you measure the kind of green-orange divide, there's an extremely strong relationship between being on one side or the other and how you voted in the EU referendum. In other words, this EU referendum, it divided people into, peop into in terms of people who wanted to leave and who wanted to stay. It also divided people in terms of whether they're Catholics or Protestants. Now, it's, uh, w there may be a number of different interpretations of exactly what that means, and I'll perhaps address those in questions, but I wanted to hone in on the, 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 the facts of the situation, what I would call the facts of the situation, and prioritize those in today's um, presentation. One can, one can see the European Union, for example, as a necessary, um, conceptually, an, an integral part of the underlying ethno-national divide that logically, if you're a Catholic nationalist, you might want to be part of a bigger supranational identity in order to dilute the effects of Britain on your polity. And if you're a, a, a Protestant unionist, you might think, well, actually, I, want, I have a particular interpretation of Britishness, and therefore I'm against the EU. Suffice to say, for current purposes, there's a very, very strong ethno-national effect on vote choice. The second interpretation that I want to hone in on is one that's getting a lot of traction in, in Britain. And that's to say that, if I can use the term, the forces of international capitalism are such that some people benefit and some people don't benefit. Some people perceive themselves to be vulnerable to international capitalism, and some people feel that they might do okay. Uh, the term globalization is always used as, often used as a shorthand for the free movement of um, capital, the free movement of labor. Within the EU, although the EU very much has a social element, it is essentially a, an economic free market project. It's got sort of kind of left-wing bits and bobs to it, but its core mission is freedom of movement of capital and freedom of movement of labor. There are people who are well able to adapt to the dynamics of such cross-border capitalism. People in this room, for example, are almost willing to bet that everyone in this room is quite highly educated and probably of a professional disposition. The argument here is that if you have, um, if you're well-educated, if you're well-skilled in terms of the job that you do, you have an adaptable skill set. You're able to react and adapt to changing economic circumstances that are a, func that are a function of the ebb and flow of um, the free movement of capital and trade. If you have low skill set, um, low education, you're going to be vulnerable to. You're going to perceive, you're go you are going to be vulnerable to, and you will perceive yourselves as being vulnerable to changes on foot of the free movement of labor and uh, capital. For example, um, if we try to test this interpretation, as has been successfully done in the British case, and we relate uh, educational qualification level to vote choice, there are extremely strong effects. People who have a postgraduate education in Northern Ireland, 80% of them voted to stay. People who have no educational qualifications, it's under 50%, or people who have GCSE or less, it's less than half. People who have a degree, it's 71%. These are very big educational effects on vote choice. Similarly, a simple question, have you gone to a grammar school or not, yields big percentage differences. <laughs> if you have gone to a grammar school, 71% stay. Uh, sorry, hold on. Uh, the differences are 71 to, to 53. Sizable percentage differences. In terms of measuring people's social class and their level of, the level of skill involved in the job they do, we find similar um, patterns and strong patterns. In the professional or middle manager class, three quarters or above people voted to stay. 
people on state benefits or semi-skilled manual, it's about half. So big, um, big class effects. Now, as well as having certain demographic traits with respect to education, qualification, and skill set, um, the argument is that these demographic traits are associated with certain attitudinal traits. In other words, if you have low education, low skill set, and feel vulnerable to the forces of globalization, free movement of, mar free movement of labor and capital, you are likely to disagree that immigration is a good thing. It's almost a, a logical consequence of your demographic position. If you ask people in our survey to agree or disagree with the following question, immigration to Northern Ireland has been good for the economy and society, you find very, very big differences. People who strongly agree with that, 85% of them voted to stay. If you strongly disagree, just under a quarter. So unsurprisingly, a very big immigration effect, as, as one might um, predict. Perhaps a little bit more surprisingly, if you ask people, if you tap people's liberal versus conservative views, you find a big effect of your attitudes to gay rights. If you ask people, do you agree or disagree that same-sex and heterosexual couples should enjoy the same rights to marry? If you strongly agree, three-quarters uh, opt to stay. If you strongly disagree, it's 29%. So if you take this cluster of um, uh, relationships together, you see, uh, uh, you, you can argue that there is a distinction between two types of people. Low class, <coughs> low educated, with socially conservative and illiberal views, higher class, high educated, who are c comfortable with essentially international liberalism and comfortable with kind of liberal, what's often characterized as liberal and progressive thought. So the EU as a project can be characterized in terms of um, being one that's liked by people with adaptable occupational skill sets, higher class, high education, and are comfortable with progressive liberalism and characterize in some way, shape, or form the EU as a liberal progressive project. Another variable that's relevant here is the extent to which you're um, alienated or not from conventional <coughs> politics. And the idea here is that if you are kind of sort of anti-politics, inverted commas, you're um, more likely to be kind of anti an establishment such as the EU. So in our survey, we had sometimes politics and government seem so complicated that a person like me cannot really understand what is going on. If you strongly agree with that, about half of the people voted to stay. If you disagree with that, you're essentially saying, I'm clever, I understand stuff, I'm not alienated from the political system, I, I, can, I can get it. Then you vote to remain. Um, so that's, there might be more work to do conceptually to kind of link all of those slides together, but I throw, throw that out to you because it's analogous to the types of arguments that are made in Britain about why people voted to leave in Britain under the catchphrase of the left behind. In terms of partisanship, I have just one slide, and there is a remarkably strong, the great thing about studying Northern Ireland is the effect sizes are massive, it doesn't matter what you do. Um, there's a remarkably strong relationship between what party you support and how you voted. So 91% of TUV supporters voted to leave, only 5% of SDLP supporters voted to leave. And as you move from TUV through DUP, UUP, Alliance, Sinn Féin, and the SDLP, there's a very strong linear decline in the number of people, the percentage of party supporters who voted to leave. Very strong effects from across the spectrum. Um, the one more thing that I promised to say something about relates to turnout, and the question is, would the result have been different if everyone had voted? In order to grapple with this, I compared people who did vote to people who didn't vote with respect to the, one of the questions in the survey which was asking people basically how much they like or hate the EU. It was a five-point scale 
where one was, I don't, you know, the EU is terrible. I forget the exact word. I don't really don't like the EU versus five is I really would like a fully integrated single European super state or something like that. So a higher score is you like Europe. The people who voted have a score of 2.1. The people who did not vote, a score of 2.5 on a five-point scale. This is statistically significantly different, and the direction is important in that people who didn't vote are more pro-European than people who did vote. If you ran the election again and there was a higher turnout, you'd get more pro-Europeans. The skeptics were a bit better at getting out, getting out their people. Oh, conclusions. I should have some conclusions. I do. Um, <laughs> Conclusions are still a little bit of a work in progress, really. There is a, it's very easy to interpret the, the political behaviour of citizens in Northern Ireland in this referendum as a function of where they stand on the green-orange divide. It's also very easy to interpret the behaviour of Northern Ireland citizens in this referendum as a function of whether they fit with the left-behind, lower-class, low-educated, socially conservative views versus liberal. Li high, highly educated liberals. One of the things I've done, which I don't have on the slides, is look at the interaction between the two. In brief, it's if, if you break down Catholics and Protestants, if you break down Catholics and Protestants with respect to class and education and all the rest of it, it's quite hard to get. It's quite hard to find Catholics who voted against, no matter what you do. Um, uh, in other words, even when you look at re really low-educated Catholics, uh, low-skill-set Catholics, socially conservative Catholics, it's hard to find a big effect. But within, within the Protestant community, there are big differences within Protestants in terms of high-educated liberal Protestants versus uh, low-educated non-liberal Protestants. I lost my watch a few weeks ago. I have a sense that I've run out of time, so I'll stop talking now. Thank you very much. Thank you.